So that covers it for number representation. Uh, now, to be honest, uh, this material is not stuff you really need to retain, at least in detail. It's very nice to have a broad outline because it helps you understand what's really going on. But in truth, uh, most programmers uh, really aren't going to be dealing with this low level of the computer and its inner workings uh, that much at all, if perhaps ever in their whole programming career. So I'm going to summarize now the stuff that you really do need to uh, retain and understand. The first thing you definitely need to know is that a byte is 8 bits, kinda. In actual fact, the definition of byte is it's that uh, number of bits, uh, the smallest number of bits which a system can address. That is, when it writes to memory or it reads to memory, it can do so in uh, that number of bits at a time. It has to write that number of bits at a time or read that number of bits at a time. And and so if you look in memory, you can think of it as an array of bytes that don't overlap. For historical reasons and perhaps technical reasons, uh, all pretty much all systems today are 8-bit, have 8-bit bytes. Though in the past there were some systems that used, that had bytes of other sizes, like 7-bits uh, or 9. We use Greek prefixes to talk about large quantities of bits and bytes. Uh, the problem is that there's some ambiguity in these terms. Uh, usually in most uh, casual conversation, they're defined as powers of 10, so say kilo would mean uh, 10 to the third, that is a thousand, so a kilo bit would be a thousand bits. However, they've uh, more traditionally been defined as powers of two, so a kilo would be defined as two to the tenth, which is 1,024, not a thousand. Recently there's been proposed a standard for uh, new prefixes uh, to mean explicitly the powers of two definition, so like uh, kibi and mebi instead of kilo and mega. However, uh, these aren't widely used yet. They may catch on, they may not. And in general, I would say you really, when it matters, and you're not just uh, in casual conversation, and you need to know exactly how big something is, and you're talking to someone, you better say, well, do you mean powers of 10, or do you mean in powers of 2? You've probably dealt with this ambiguity yourself. You've probably encountered it if you bought a hard drive, and it says, say, on a box, it says it's 100 gigabytes, but then when uh, you put it in your system and say Windows reports how big it is, Windows reports the size of the drive in terms of powers of 2, whereas on the box they put it in powers of 10. The reason the hard drive manufacturers use powers of 10 is because they can say 100 gigabytes. If they mean powers of 10, then they d that's, less, that's less bytes than it would be if it meant powers of 2, so they can kind of... Uh, they can make their product sound like it has more capacity if they use the powers of 10 definition rather than the powers of 2 definition. In fact, there was a case recently of uh, Western Digital being uh, sued in a class action lawsuit for this reason, false advertising and so on. The really important thing to understand in general about binary data is that it has no inherent meaning. Uh, that is, when you write uh, binary data, it only means what you meant it to mean when you write it. Consequently, the only way for data to have meaning is that the reader uh, the reader makes a correct assumption about how it was supposed to have meaning when it was written. Hmm. Uh, as an illustration, imagine, say, you're a scout in a war, and it's your job to light the uh, signal fire when the enemy army approaches. So you're sending a message by lighting a signal fire, but there's no meaning that's inherent in, in the signal fire. The way meaning is being conveyed is that uh, your commanding officer back at your camp uh, knew what this was supposed to mean ahead of time, because ahead of time this meaning was hammered out by agreement, and agreement is the key concept here. So in fact you can express any data in any arbitrary way as long as the thing doing the reading of the data agrees to interpret it that way. Now, of course, uh, it would be a bad idea if everyone did uh, their data representation in an infinite number of arbitrarily different ways, and uh, moreover, uh, some, way, some data is best represented in certain ways. So there are definitely standard ways of representing certain data, and numbers are a prime example of that. And so internally, uh, numbers are represented, integer values are represented in uh, their binary equivalents, that is, in normal everyday usage, we uh, write numbers in decimal form, 
but in the computer we use uh, the binary number system, which is just uh, a base two system. Binary, of course, is the natural choice for computers because it uses just two symbols, and internally computers represent all data as bits, which are these things with two states, an on and off state. So there's a very neat correspondence there. The only real problem with binary is that uh, if even small quantities uh, are expressed, uh, you're using a whole lot of digits to express them, so they take up a lot of space when written out, and that makes it difficult to read and write. So uh, we use hexadecimal and octal as ways of writing binary in abbreviated form. Though I should say octal has very limited use these days. It's not seen very often. There are two ways of representing negative integers. One's called the ones complement form, and the other is the twos complement form. In ones complement form, uh, it's really just the same, except we set aside the, the high bit, uh, that is the leftmost bit, to uh, indicate the sign. When that bit is cleared, then the value is positive. When the bit is set, then the value is negative. Two's complement form is uh, much less intuitive. Effectively, the high bit also indicates a sign in the same way. It's just that uh, the difference between uh, a positive number and its, uh, its negative, the difference between them is more than just setting the high bit. So say, if you have positive 5 and you want negative 5, you do more than just set the, the high bit to 1. The conversion process is actually, you take the number, if you want to convert from negative to positive or positive to negative in 2's complement, you flip all the bits and then you add 1. And this is quite odd, but if you chart it out in a circle, you'll see that it really kind of goes, uh, it, it actually loops around, as I demonstrated earlier. The advantage of two's complement, the reason we have it, even though it's much less intuitive, is that uh, in some cases it makes uh, computation easier to, to, to do. There are three ways of representing rational values, which are non-integer values essentially, things like 8 over 7 or 25.3, etc. The first scheme is called rational notation. It uses uh, two integers. Uh, one is d used to represent the numerator, the other is used to represent the denominator. That's pretty straightforward. The second scheme for representing rational values is called fixed point. This is essentially the equivalent of writing, expressing numbers as, say, 32.7 rather than as a fraction. So you can think of it as simply designating some bits to be left of the radix point and some bits to represent the right of the radix point. And radix point, you're probably used to calling it the decimal point, by the way, but more accurately it's, accurately it's called the radix point. Now that's a fairly simple idea there, except uh, what you do not ex generally uh, expect when you encounter this is that the conversion from decimal to binary on the right side of a radix point works differently than it does uh, on the conversion of the left side of, of the radix point, and you get some surprises. And I discussed this in detail. However, uh, it's, it may be a difficult concept to grasp, but once you get it, it's really quite a simple idea. The third scheme is called floating point, and it is essentially the uh, computing equivalent of scientific notation. Uh, you represent values as being the product of a significant, otherwise known as uh, the mantissa, multiplied times an exponent. There's nothing particularly tricky about floating point uh, a, any more than there is about fixed point. Once you understand fixed point, I think it's much easier to grasp floating point. The real trick, I think, is really in understanding how uh, values uh, expressed in binary right of the radix point, uh, how they de the translation from decimal is difficult and understanding it is difficult. Other than that, I think it's pretty straightforward. However, that said, there is the IEEE standard for floating point, uh, which, as I showed you earlier, it arrays the the way it organizes the bits uh, is a bit odd, as as you may remember. The other thing to remember about the IEEE floating point standard is that it reserves six special values, uh, plus zero, negative zero, positive infinity, negative infinity, quiet not a number, and signaling not a number. And those not a numbers are for special uh, are special values indicating essentially that something went wrong, that the result of an operation has an indeterminate value in the case of quiet not a number, or that the operation itself was bogus in the case of signaling not a number.